Tragedy by John Dryden All for Love or The World Well Lost What flocks of critics hover here today as vultures wait on armies for their prey all gaping for the carcass of a play With croaking notes they bode some dire event and follow dying poets by the scent Ours gives himself for gone You've watched your time, he fights this day unarmed, without his rhyme, and brings a tale which often has been told, as sad as Dido's and almost as old. His hero, whom you wits his bully call, baits of his metal and scarce rants at all. He's somewhat lewd, but a well-meaning mind, weeps much, fights little, but is wondrous kind. In short, a pattern and companion fit for all the keeping Tonys of the pit. I could name more. A wife and mistress too, both, to be plain, too good for most of you. The wife well-natured and the mistress true. Now, poets, if your fame has been his care, allow him all the candour you can spare. A brave man scorns to quarrel once a day. Like Hector's in at every petty fray, let those find fault whose wits so very small they've need to show that they can think at all. Errors like straws upon the surface flow, he who would search for pearls must dive below. Fops may have leave to level all they can, as pygmies would be glad to lop a man. Half wits are fleas. So little and so light, we scarce could know they live, but that they bite. But as the rich, when tired with daily feasts, for change become their next poor tenants' guests, drink hearty draughts of ale from plain brown bowls, and snatch the homely rasher from the coals. So you, retiring from much better cheer, for once may venture to do penance here. And since that plenteous autumn now is past, whose grapes and peaches have indulged your taste, take in good part from our poor poet's board such rivalled fruits as winter can afford. Scene Alexandria. Act I. The Temple of Isis. Enter Serapion, Miris, Priests of Isis. Portents and prodigies have grown so frequent that they have lost their name. Our fruitful Nile flowed ere the wonted season, with a torrent so unexpected and so wondrous fierce that the wild deluge o'ertook the haste even of the hinds that watched it. Men and beasts were born above the tops of trees that grew on the utmost margin of the water mark. Then, with so swift an ebb, the flood drove backward. It slipped from underneath the scaly herd. Here monstrous foci panted on the shore. Forsaken dolphin there, with their broad tails, lay lashing the departing waves. Hard by them, Seahorses, floundering in the slimy mud, tossed up their heads and dashed the ooze about them. Enter Alexis behind them. Avert these omens, heaven. Last night, between the hours of twelve and one, in a lone aisle of the temple while I walked, a whirlwind rose that with a violent blast shook all the dome. The doors around me clapped. The iron wicket that defends the vault, where the long race of Ptolemies is laid, burst open and disclosed the mighty dead. From out each monument in order placed, an armed ghost starts up. The boy king last reared his inglorious head. A peal of groans then followed, and a lamentable voice cried, Egypt is no more. My blood ran back, my shaking knees against each other not. On the cold pavement down I fell entranced, and so unfinished left the horrid scene. Alexis showing himself. 
and、uh, dreamed you this, or did invent the story, to frighten our Egyptian boys withal, and train them up betimes in fear of priesthood. My lord, I saw you not, nor meant my words should reach your ears, but what I uttered was most true. A foolish dream, bred from the fumes of indigested feasts and holy luxury. I know my duty. This goes no further. Tis not fit it should, nor would the times now bear it were it true. All southern from yon hills, the Roman camp hung o'er us black and threatening, like a storm just breaking on our heads. Our faint Egyptians pray for Antony, but in their servile hearts they own Octavius. Why then does Antony dream out his hours and tempts not fortune for a noble day, which might redeem what Actium lost? He thinks tis past recovery. Yet the foe seems not to press the siege. Oh, there's the wonder, my Kinas and Agrippa, who can most with Caesar are his foes. His wife Octavia, driven from his house, solicits her revenge. And Dolabella, who was once his friend, upon some private grudge, now seeks his ruin. Yet still war seems on either side to sleep. Tis strange that Antony, for some days past, has not beheld the face of Cleopatra, but here in Isis' temple lives retired, and makes his heart a prey to black despair. Tis true. And we must fear he hopes by absence to cure his mind of love. If he be vanquished, or make his peace, Egypt is doomed to be a Roman province, and our plenteous harvests must then redeem the scarceness of their soil. While Antony stood firm, our Alexandria rivalled proud Rome, dominion's other seat. And fortune, striding like a vast colossus, could fix an equal foot of empire here. Had I my wish, these tyrants of all nature, who lord it o'er mankind, would perish, perish, eat by the other's sword. But since our will is lamely followed by our power, we must depend on one, with him to rise or fall. How stands the queen affected? Oh, said Dod, said Dod, Serapion, on this vanquished man, and wins herself about his mighty ruins, whom would she yet forsake, yet yield him up, this hunted prey to his pursuer's hands, she might preserve us all, but tis in vain. This changes my designs, this blasts my counsels, and makes me use all means to keep him here, whom I could wish divided from her arms. Far as the earth deep centre, well, you know the state of things. No more of your ill omens and black prognostics. Labour to confirm the people's hearts. Enter Ventidius, talking aside with a gentleman of Antony's. These Romans will all hear us. But who's that stranger? By his warlike port, his fierce demeanour, and erected look. He's of no vulgar note. Oh, tis Vendatius, our emperor's great lieutenant in the east, who first so drummed that Parthia would be conquered. When Antony returned from Syria last, he left this man to guard the Roman frontiers. You seem to know him well. Too well. I saw him at Sicilia first, when Cleopatra there met Antony. A mortal foe was to us and Egypt, but. Let me witness to the war I hate. A braver Roman never drew a sword. Firm to his prince, but as a friend, not slave, he ne'er was of his pleasures. But besides, o'er all his cooler hours and morning councils, in short, the plainness, fierceness, ragged virtue of an old true stamp Roman lives in him. His coming bodes I know not what of ill to our affairs. Withdraw to mark him better, and I'll acquaint you why I sought you here, and what's our present work. They withdraw to a corner of the stage, and Ventidius, with the other, comes forward to the front. Not see him, say you? 
I say I must, and will. He is commanded, on pain of death, none should approach his presence. I bring him news that will raise his drooping spirits, give him new life. He sees not Cleopatra. Would he had never seen her. He eats not, drinks not, sleeps not, has no use of anything but thought. Or if he talks, tis to himself, and then tis perfect raving. Then he defies the world and bids it pass. Sometimes he gnaws his lips and curses loud the boy Octavius. Then he draws his mouth into a scornful smile and cries, Take all, the world's not worth my care. Just, just his nature, virtue's his path, but sometimes tis too narrow for his vast soul. And then he starts out wide and bounds into a vice that bears him far from his first course and plunges him in ills. But when his danger makes him find his faults, quick to observe and full of sharp remorse, he censures eagerly his own misdeeds, judging himself with malice to himself, and not forgiving what as man he did, because his other parts are more than man. He must not thus be lost. Alexis and the priests come forward. You have your full instructions. Now advance, proclaim your orders loudly. Romans, Egyptians, hear the Queen's command. Thus Cleopatra bids. Let labour cease. To pomp and triumphs give this happy day that gave the world a lord, tis Antony's. Live, Antony, and Cleopatra live. Be this the general voice sent up to heaven, and every public place repeat this echo. Ventidius aside. Fine pageantry. Set out before your doors the images of all your sleeping fathers, with laurels crowned. With laurels wreathe your posts, and strew with flowers the pavement. Let the priests do present sacrifice. Pour out the wine, and call the gods to join with you in gladness. Curse on the tongue that bids this general joy. Can they be friends of Antony, who revel when Antony's in danger? Hide for shame, you Romans, your great-grandsire's images, for fear their souls should animate their marbles, to blush at their degenerate progeny. A love which knows no bounds to Androny would mark the day with honours, when all heaven laboured for him, when its propulsive stars stood wakeful in his orb towards the tower and said his better influence. Her own birthday our queen neglected like a vulgar fate that passed obscurely by. Would it had slept, divided far from his, till some remote and future age had called it out to ruin some other prince, not him? Your emperor, though grown unkind, would be more gentle than to abrade my queen for loving him too well. Does the mute sacrifice upbraid the priest? He knows him not his executioner. Oh, she has decked his ruin with her love, led him in golden bands to gaudy slaughter, and made perdition pleasing. She has left him the blank of what he was. I tell thee, eunuch, she has quite unmanned him. Can any Roman see and know him now? thus altered from the lord of half mankind, unbent, unsinewed, made a woman's toy, shrunk from the vast extent of all his honours and cramped within a corner of the world. O oh, Antony, thou bravest soldier and thou best of friends, bounteous as nature, next to nature's god, couldst thou but make new worlds, so wouldst thou give them as bounty were thy being, rough in battle, as the first Romans when they went to war, yet after victory more pitiful than all their praying virgins left at home. 
Would you grant to those more sign in virtues his truth to her who loves him? Would I could not. But wherefore waste I precious hours with thee? Thou art her darling mischief, her chief engine, Antony's other fate. Go tell thy queen, Ventidius is arrived to end her charms. Let your Egyptian timbrels play alone, nor mix effeminate sounds with Roman trumpets. You dare not fight for Antony. Go pray and keep your coward's holiday in temples. Exorn Alexis Serapion. Re-enter the gentleman of Mark Antony. The emperor approaches and commands on pain of death that none presume to stay. I dare not disobey him. Going out with the other. Well, I dare. But I'll observe him first unseen and find which way his humour drives. The rest I'll venture. Withdraws. Enter Antony walking with a disturbed motion before he speaks. They tell me tis my birthday, and I'll keep it with double pomp of sadness. Tis what the day deserves, which gave me breath. Why was I raised the meteor of the world, hung in the skies, and blazing as I travelled till all my fires were spent, and then cast downward to be trod out by Caesar? Ventidius aside. On my soul, tis mournful. Wondrous mournful. Count thy gains. Now, Antony, wouldst thou be born for this? Glutton of fortune, thy devouring youth has starved thy wanting age. Ventidius aside. How sorrow shakes him. So now the tempest tears him up by the roots, and on the ground extends the noble ruin. Antony having thrown himself down. Lie there. Thou shadow of an emperor, the place thou pressest on thy mother earth is all thy empire now. Now it contains thee, some few days hence, and then twill be too large, when thou art contracted in thy narrow urn, shrunk to a few ashes. Then Octavia, for Cleopatra will not live to see it, Octavia then will have thee all her own, and bear thee in her widowed hand to Caesar. Caesar will weep. The crocodile will weep to see his rival of the universe lie still and peaceful there. Oh, think no more on't. Give me some music. Look that it be sad. I'll soothe my melancholy till I swell and burst myself with sighing. Soft music. Tis somewhat to my humour. Stay, I fancy. I'm now turned wild, a common of nature, of all forsaken and forsaken all. Live in a shady forest, sylvan scene, Stretched at my length beneath some blasted oak, I lean my head upon the mossy bark, And look just of a piece as I grew from it. My uncombed locks, matted like mistletoe, Hang o'er my hoary face, A murmuring brook runs at my foot. Methinks I fancy myself there, too. The herd come jumping by me, And fearless, Quench their thirst while I look on, And take me for their fellow citizen. More of this image, more, It lulls my thoughts. Soft music again. I must disturb him, I can hold no longer. Stands before him. Antony starting up. Art thou Ventidius? Are you Antony? I'm liker what I was than you to him I left you last. I'm angry. So am I. I would be private. Leave me. Sir? I love you, and therefore will not leave you. Will not leave me? Where have you learnt that answer? Who am I? My emperor. The man I love next heaven. If I said more, I think twas scare a sin. You're all that's good and godlike. Oh, that's wretched. You will not leave me, then. It was too presuming to say I would not. But I dare not leave you. And it is unkind in you to chide me hence so soon, when I so far have come to see you. Now thou hast seen me, art thou satisfied? For if a friend thou hast beheld enough, 
and of a foe too much. Look, Emperor, this is no common dew. Ventidius weeping. I have not wept this forty years, but now my mother comes afresh into my eyes. I cannot help her softness. By heavens he weeps. Poor good old man, he weeps. The big round drops course one another down the furrows of his cheeks. Stop them, Ventidius, or I shall blush to death. They set my shame that calls them full before me. I'll do my best. Sure there is contagion in the tears of friends. See, I have caught it too. Believe me, tis not for my own griefs, but thine. Nay, father. Emperor. Emperor. Why, that's the style of victory. The conquering soldier, red with unfelt wounds, salutes his general so. But never more shall that sound reach my ears. I warrant you. Actium. Actium. Oh, it sits too near you. Here, here it lies, a lump of lead by day, and in my short, distracted, nightly slumbers, the hag that rides my dreams. Out with it! Give it vent! Urge not my shame. I lost a battle. So has Julius done. Thou favourest me, and speaks not half thou thinkst, for Julius fought it out and lost it fairly. But Antony— Nay, stop not! Antony! Well, thou wilt have it, like a coward fled, fled while his soldiers fought. Fled first, Ventidius. Thou longst to curse me, and I give thee leave. I know thou canst prepared to rail. I did! I'll help thee. I have been a man, Ventidius. Yes, and a brave one. But... I know thy meaning, but I have lost my reason. I have disgraced the name of soldier with inglorious ease. In the full vintage of my flowing honours, sat still and sought pressed by other hands. Fortune came smiling to my youth and wooed it, and purple greatness met my ripened years. When first I came to empire, I was born on tides of people, crowding to my triumphs, the wish of nations, and the willing world received me as its pledge of future peace. I was so great, so happy, so beloved, fate could not ruin me, till I took pains and worked against my fortune, child her from me, and returned her loose. Yet still she came again, my careless days and my luxurious night. At length have wearied her, and now she's gone, 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 divorced forever. Help me, soldier, to curse this madman, this industrious fool, who laboured to be wretched. Prithee, curse me. No. Why? You are too sensible already of what you've done, too conscious of your failings. Like a scorpion whipped by others first to fury, sting yourself in mad revenge. I would bring balm and pour it in your wounds, cure your distempered mind, and heal your fortunes. I know thou wouldst. I will. <laughs> you laugh? I do, to see officious love give cordials to the dead. You would be lost then? I am. I say you are not. Try your fortune. I have, to the utmost. Dost thou think me desperate without just cause? No. When I found all lost beyond repair, I hid me from the world, and learned to scorn it here. But now I do so, heartily, I think it is not worth the cost of keeping. Caesar thinks not so. He'll thank you for the gift he could not take. You would be killed like Tully, would you? Do hold out your throat to Caesar and die tamely. No, I can kill myself and so resolve. I can die with you too when time shall serve. But fortune calls upon us now to live, to fight, to conquer. Sure thou dreamst, Ventidius. No. 
"'Tis you, Dream. "'You sleep away your hours in desperate sloth, "'miscalled philosophy. "'Up, up, for honour's sake! Twelve legions wait you, and long to call you chief. "'By painful journeys I led them, "'patient both of heat and hunger, "'down from the Parthian marches to the Nile. "'Twill do you good to see their sunburnt faces, "'their scarred cheeks and chopped hands. "'There's virtue in them. They'll sell those mangled limbs at dearer rates than yon trim bands can buy. Where left you them? I said in lower Syria. Bring them hither. There may be life in these. They will not come. Why didst thou mock my hopes with promised aids to double my despair? They are mutinous. Most firm and loyal. Yet they will not march to succour me. O oh, trifler! They petition you would make haste to head them. I'm besieged. There's but one way shut up. How came I hither? I will not stir. They would perhaps desire a better reason. I have never used my soldiers to demand a reason of my actions. Why did they refuse to march? They said they would not fight for Cleopatra. What was they said? They said they would not fight for Cleopatra. Why should they fight indeed to make her conquer and make you more a slave, to gain you kingdoms which for a kiss at your next midnight feast you'll sell to her? Then she new names her jewels and calls this diamond such or such a tax. Each pendant in her ear shall be a province. Ventidius, I allow your tongue free license on all my other faults, but on your life no word of Cleopatra. She deserves more worlds than I can lose. Behold, you powers! To whom you have entrusted humankind. See Europe, Africa, Asia put in balance, and all weighed down by one light, worthless woman. I think the gods are Antony's, and give, like prodigals, this nether world away to none but wasteful hands. You grow presumptuous. I take the privilege of plain love to speak. Plain love? Plain arrogance, plain insolence. Thy men are cowards, thou an envious traitor, who, under seeming honesty, hast vented the burden of thy rank, overflowing gall. Oh, that thou wert my equal, great in arms as the first Caesar was, that I might kill thee without a stain to honour. You may kill me. You have done more already. Called me traitor. Art thou not one? For showing you yourself, which none else durst have done. But had I been that name which I disdain to speak again, I needed not have sought your abject fortunes, come to partake your fate, to die with you. What hindered me to have led my conquering eagles to fill Octavius's bands? I could have been a traitor then. A glorious, happy traitor, and not have been so called. Forgive me, Sosa. I have been too passionate. You thought me false. Thought my old age betrayed you. Kill me, sir. Pray, kill me. Yet you need not. Your unkindness has left your sword no work. I did not think so. I said it in my rage. Prithee, forgive me. Why didst thou tempt my anger by discovery of what I would not hear? No prince but you could merit that sincerity I used, nor durst another man have ventured it. But you, ere love misled your wandering eyes, were sure the chief and best of human race, framed in the very pride and boast of nature, so perfect that the gods who formed you wondered at their own skill and cried, A lucky hit has mended our design. Their envy hindered, else you had been immortal, and a pattern when heaven would work for ostentation's sake to copy out again. But, Cleopatra, go on, for I can bear it now. No more. Thou darest not trust my passion, but thou mayst. Thou only lovest the rest have flattered me. Heaven's blessing on your heart for that kind word. May I believe you love me. Speak again. Indeed I do. Speak this, and this, and this. Hugging him. 
Thy praises were unjust, but I'll deserve them, and yet mend all. Do with me what thou wilt. Lead me to victory. Thou knowst the way. And will you leave this? Prithee, do not curse her, and I will leave her. Though heaven knows I love beyond life, conquest, empire, all but honour. But I will leave her. That's my royal master. And shall we fight? I warrant thee, old soldier, thou shalt be me once again in iron, and at the head of our old troops that beat the Parthians cry aloud. Come, follow me. Oh, now I hear my emperor. In that word Octavius fell. Gods let me see that day, and if I have ten years behind, take all. I'll thank you for the exchange. O oh, Cleopatra. Again? I've done. In that last sigh she went. Caesar shall know what tis to force the lover from all he holds most dear. Methinks you breathe another soul. Your looks are more divine. You speak a hero, and you move a god. Oh, thou hast fired me. My soul's up in arms, and man's each part about me. Once again that noble eagerness of fight has seized me, that eagerness with which I darted upward to Cassius's camp. In vain the steepy hill opposed my way. In vain a war of spears sung round my head and planted on my shield. I won the trenches while my foremost men lagged on the plain below. Ye gods, ye gods, for such another honour! Come on, my soldier. Our hearts and arms are still the same. I long once more to meet our foes, that thou and I, like time and death, marching before our troops, may taste fate to them, mow them out a passage, and, entering where the foremost squadrons yield, begin the noble harvest of the field. Act Two. Enter Cleopatra, Iris, and Alexis. What shall I do, or whither shall I turn? Ventidius has all come, and he will go. He goes to fight for you. Then he would see me ere he went to fight. Flatter me not. Once he goes, he's lost, and all my hopes destroyed. Does this weak passion become a mighty queen? I am no queen. Is this to be a queen, to be besieged by yon insulting Roman, and to wait each hour the victor's chain? These ills are small, for Antony is lost, and I can mourn for nothing else but him. Now, come, Octavius, I have no more to lose. Prepare thy bands, I am fit to be a captive. Antony has taught my mind the fortune of a slave. Call reason to assist you. I have none, and none would have. My love's a noble madness, which shows the cause deserved it. Moderate sorrow fits vulgar love, and for a vulgar man. But I have loved with such transcendent passion, I soared at first, quite out of reason's view, and now am lost above it. No, I am proud tis thus. Would Antony could see me now, Think you he would not sigh, though he must leave me? Sure he would sigh, for he is noble-natured, and bears a tender heart. I know him well. Ah, oh, no, I know him not. I knew him once, but now tis past. Let it be past with you. Forget him, madam. Never, never, Iris. He once was mine, and once, though now tis gone, leaves a faint image of possession still. Think him inconstant, cruel, and ungrateful. I cannot. If I could, those thoughts were vain. Faithless, ungrateful, cruel though he be, I still must love him. Enter Carmian. Now, what news, my Carmian? Will he be kind, and will he not forsake me? Am I to live or die? Nay, do I live, or am I dead? For when he gave his answer, fate took the word, and then I lived or died. I found him, madam. A long speech preparing? If thou bring'st comfort, haste and give it to me, for never was more need. I know he loves you. Had he been kind, her eyes had told me so before her tongue could speak it. Now she studies, to soften what he said. 
but give me death, just as he sent at Carmion, undisguised, and in the words he spoke. I found him, then, encompassed around, I think, with iron statues. So mute, so motionless his soldiers stood, while awfully he cast his eyes about, and every leader's hopes or fears surveyed. Methought he looked resolved, and yet not pleased. When he beheld me struggling in the crowd, he blushed, and bade make way. There's comfort yet. Ventidius fixed his eyes upon my passage, severely, as he meant to frown me back, and sullenly gave place. I told my message, just as you gave it, broken and disordered. I numbered in it all your sighs and tears, and while I moved your pitiful request, that you but only begged a last farewell, he fetched an inward groan, and every time I named you, sighed, as if his heart were breaking but shunned my eyes, and guiltily looked down. He seems not now that awful Antony, who shook an armed assembly with his nod, but, making show as he would rub his eyes, disguised and blotted out a falling tear. Did he then weep? And was I worth a tear? If what thou hast to say be not as pleasing, tell me no more, but let me die contented. He bid me say, he knew himself so well, he could deny you nothing if he saw you. And therefore, thou wouldst say he would not see me? And therefore begged you not to use a power, which he could ill resist, yet he should ever respect you as he ought. Is that a word for Antony to use to Cleopatra? Oh, that faint word, respect, how I disdain it, disdain myself for loving after it. He should have kept that word for cold Octavia. Respect is for a wife. Am I that thing, that dull, insipid lump, without desires and without power to give them? You misjudge. You see through love, and that deludes your sight, as what is straight seems crooked through the water. But I, who bear my reason undisturbed, can see this Antony, this dreaded man, a fearful slave, who fain would run away and suns his master's eyes. If you pursue him, my life on it, he still drags a chain along that needs must clock his flight. Could I believe thee? By every circumstance I know he loves. True, his heart pressed by interest and by honor, yet he but doubts and parleys and casts out many a long look for succor. He sends word, he fears to see my face. And would you more? He sows his weakness who declines the combat, and you must urge your fortune. Could he speak more plainly? To my ears the message sounds. Come to my rescue, Cleopatra, come. Come, free me from Ventitus, from my tyrant. See me and give me a pretense to leave him. I hear his trumpets. This way he must pass. Please you retire a while. I'll work him first, then he may bend more easy. You shall rule me, but all I fear in vain. Exit with Carmion and Iris. I fear so too, though I concealed my thoughts to make her bold, but is our utmost means and fate befriended it. Withdraws. Enter Lictors with Facies, one bearing the eagle, then enter Antony with Ventidius, followed by other commanders. Octavius is the minion of blind chance, but holds from virtue nothing. Has he courage? But just enough to season him from coward. Oh, tis the coldest youth upon a charge, the most deliberate fighter. If he ventures, as in Illyria once they say he did to storm a town, tis when he cannot choose, when all the world have fixed their eyes upon him, and then he lives on that for seven years after. But at a close revenge he never fails. I heard you challenged him. I did, Ventidius. What thinkst thou was his answer? Twas so tame. He said he had more ways than one to die. I had not. Poor. He has more ways than one, but he would choose them all before that one. He first would choose an ague or a fever. No, it must be an ague, not a fever. He has not warmth enough to die by that. Or old age and a bed. Aye, there's his choice. 
he would live like a lamp to the last wink, and crawl the utmost verge of life. Oh, Hercules, why should a man like this, who dares not trust his fate for one great action, be all the care of heaven? Why should he lord it o'er fourscore thousand men, of whom each one is braver than himself? You conquered for him. Philippine knows it. There you shared with him that empire which your sword made all your own. Fool that I was, upon my eagle's wings I bore this wren, till I was tired with soaring, and now he mounts above me. Good heavens, is this, is this the man who braves me? Who bids my age make way, drives me before him to the world's ridge, and sweeps me off like rubbish? Sir, we lose time. The troops are mounted all. Then give the word to march. I long to leave this prison of a town, to join thy legions, and, in open field, once more to show my face. Lead, my deliverer. Enter Alexis. Great emperor, in mighty arms re-owned above mankind, but in soft pity to the oppressed a god, this message sends the mournful Cleopatra to her departing lord. Smooth sycophant! A thousand wishes and ten thousand prayers, millions of blessings wait you to the wars, Millions of sighs and tears he sent you too, and would have sent as many dear embraces to your arms, as many parting kisses to your lips. But those, he fears, have wearied you already. Ventidius aside. False crocodile! And yet she begs not now you would not leave her, that were a wish too mighty for her hopes, too presuming for her low fortune and your ebb in love. That were a wish for her more prosperous days, her blooming beauty, and your growing kindness. Antony aside. Well, I must man it out. What would the queen? First, to these noble warriors who attend your daring courage in the chase of fame, too daring and too dangerous for her quiet, she humbly recommends all she holds dear all her own cares and fears, the care of you. Yes, witness Actium. Let him speak, Ventidius. You, when this matchless valour bears him forward, with ardour too heroic on his foes, fall down as he would do before his feet, lie in his way and stop the paths of death. Tell him this god is not invulnerable, that absent Cleopatra bleeds in him, and... That you may remember her petition, she begs you wear these trifles as a pawn, which at your wished return she will redeem. Gives jewels to the commanders. With all the wealth of Egypt, this to the great Venditus she presents, whom she can never count her enemy, because he loves her lord. Tell her I'll not on I'm not ashamed of honest poverty. Not all the diamonds of the East can bribe Ventidius from his faith. I hope to see these and the rest of all her sparkling store where they shall more deservingly be placed. And who must wear them, then? The wronged Octavia. You might have spared that word. And he that bribe. But have I no remembrance? Yes, a dear one. Your slave, the queen. My mistress. Then your mistress, your mistress would, she says, have sent her soul, but that you had long since, she humbly begs this ruby bracelet, set with bleeding hearts, the emblems of her own, may bind your arm. Presenting a bracelet. Now, my best lord, in honour's name, I ask you, for manhood's sake and for your own dear safety, touch not these poisoned gifts. Infected by the sender, touch them not. Myriads of bluest plagues lie underneath them, and more than aconite has dipped the silk. Nay, now you grow too cynical, Ventidius. A lady's favours may be worn with honour. What, to refuse a bracelet? On oh, my soul, when I lie pensive in my tent alone, twill pass the wakeful hours of winter nights to tell these pretty beads upon my arm. To count for every one a soft embrace, A melting kiss at such and such a time, And now and then the fury of a love, When, and what harm's in this? 
Known, known, my lord. But what's to her that's now dispassed forever? Antony, going to tie it. <laughs> we soldiers are so awkward. Help me tie it. In faith, my lord, we courtiers too are awkward in these affairs. So are all men indeed. Even I, who am I not one? But shall I speak? Yes, freely. Then, my lord, fair hands alone are fit to tie it. See who send it can. Hell, death! This eunuch panda ruins you. You will not see her. Alexis whispers an attendant who goes out. But to take my leave. Then I have washed an Ethiop. You're undone. You're in the toils. You're taken. You're destroyed. Her eyes do Caesar's work. You fear too soon. I'm constant to myself. I know my strength. And yet she shall not think me barbarous neither, born in the depths of Afric. I am a Roman, bred in the rules of soft humanity. A guest, and kindly used, should bid farewell. You do not know how weak you are to her, how much an infant. You are not proof against a smile or glance. A sigh will quite disarm you. See, she comes. Now you shall find your error. Gods, I thank you. I form the danger greater than it was, and now tis near, tis lessened. Mark the end yet. Enter Cleopatra, Carmion, and Iris. Well, madam, we are met. Is this a meeting? Then we must part? We must. Who says we must? Our own hard fates. We make those fates ourselves. Yes, we have made them. We have loved each other into our mutual ruin. The gods have seen my joys with envious eyes. I have no friends in heaven, and all the world, as t'were the business of mankind to part us, is armed against my love. Even you yourself join with the rest. You, you are armed against me. I will be justified in all I do to late posterity, and therefore hear me. If I mix the lie with any truth, reproach me freely with it, else favour me with silence. You command me, and I am dumb. I like this well. He shows authority. That I derive my ruin from you alone. Oh, heavens, I ruin you? You promise me your silence, and you break it ere I have scarce begun. Well, I obey you. When I beheld you first, it was in Egypt. Ere Caesar saw your eyes, you gave me love, and were too young to know it. That I settled your father in his throne was for your sake. I left the acknowledgment for time to ripen. Caesar stepped in and, with a greedy hand, plucked the green fruit ere the first blush of red, yet cleaving to the bough. He was my lord, and was, beside, too great for me to rival. But I deserved you first, though he enjoyed you, when after I beheld you in Cilicia, an enemy to Rome, I pardoned you. I cleared myself. Again you break your promise. I loved you still, and took your weak excuses, took you into my bosom, stained by Caesar, and not half mine. I went to Egypt with you, and hid me from the business of the world, shut out inquiring nations from my sight, to give whole years to you. Ventidius aside. Yes, to your shame be it spoken. How I loved. Witness ye days and nights and all ye hours that danced away with down upon your feet as all your business were to count my passion. One day passed by and nothing saw but love. Another came and still t'was only love. The sons were wearied out with looking on and I untied with loving. I saw you every day and all the day and every day was still but as the first. So eager was I still to see you more. Tis all too true. Fulvia, my wife, grew jealous, as she indeed had reason, raised a war in Italy to call me back. But yet you went not. While within your arms I lay, the world fell mouldering from my hands each hour and left me scarce a grasp. I thank your love for it. 
Well pushed. That last was home. Yet, may I speak? If I have urged a falsehood, yes, else not. Your silence says I have not. Fulvia died, pardon your gods, with my unkindness, died. To set the world at peace I took Octavia, this Caesar's sister, in her pride of youth, and flower of beauty, did I wed that lady, whom blushing I must praise, because I loved her. You called, my love obeyed the fatal summons, this raised the Roman arms, the cause was yours. I would have fought by land where I was stronger, you hindered it, yet when I fought at sea, forsook me fighting, and, O oh, stain to honour, O oh, lasting shame, I knew not that I fled, but fled to follow you. What haste she made to hoist her purple sails, and to appear magnificent in flight, drew half our strength away. All this you caused, and would you multiply more ruins on me? This honest man, my best, my only friend, has gathered up the shipwreck of my fortunes. Twelve legions I have left, my last recruits. And you have watched the news, and bring your eyes to seize them too. If you have aught to answer, now speak. You have free leave. Alexis aside. She stands confounded. Despair is in her eyes. Now lay a sigh in the way to stop his passage. Prepare a tear and bid it for his legions. It is like they shall be sold. How shall I plead my cause when you, my judge, have already condemned me? Shall I bring the love you bore me for my advocate? That now is turned against me, that destroys me. For love, once past, is at the best forgotten, but oftener sours to hate. Twill please my lord to ruin me, and therefore I'll be guilty. But could I once have thought it would have pleased you, that you would pry with narrow searching eyes into my faults, severe to my destruction? and watching all advantages with care that serve to make me wretched. Speak, my lord, for I end here, though I deserved this usage. Was it like you to give it? Oh, you wrong me. To think I sought this parting, or desired to accuse you more than what will clear myself and justify this breach. Thus low I thank you, and since my innocence will not offend, I shall not blush to own it. After this I think she'll blush at nothing. You seem grieved, and therein you are kind, that Caesar first enjoyed my love, though you deserved it better. I grieve for that, my lord, much more than you, for, had I first been yours, it would have saved my second choice. I never had been his, and ne'er had been but yours. But Caesar first, you say, possessed my love? Not so, my lord. He first possessed my person, you my love. Caesar loved me, but I loved Antony. If I endured him after, t'was because I judged it due to the first name of men, and half constrained, I gave as to a tyrant what he would take by force. Oh, Siren! Siren! Yet grant that all the love she boasts were true. Has she not ruined you? I still urge that, the fatal consequence. The consequence, indeed, for I dare challenge him, my greatest foe, to say it was designed. Tis true I loved you, and kept you far from an uneasy wife, such Fulvia was. Yes, but he'll say, you left Octavia for me, and can you blame me to receive that love which quitted such desert for worthless me? How often have I wished some other Caesar, great as the first and as the second young, would court my love to be refused for you. Words, words! But Actium, sir, remember Actium! Even there I dare his malice. True, I counselled to fight at sea, but I betrayed you not. I fled, but not to the enemy. T'was fear. Would I had been a man not to have feared, for none would then have envied me your friendship, who envy me your love. We are both unhappy. If nothing else, yet our ill fortune parts us. Speak, would you have me perish by my stay? If, as a friend, you ask my judgment, go. 
if as a lover, stay. If you must perish, tis a hard word, but stay. See now the effects of her so boasted love. She strives to drag you down to ruin with her. But could she scape without you, oh, how soon would she let go her hold, and haste to shore, and never look behind? Then judge my love by this. Giving Antony a writing. Could I have borne a life or death, a happiness or woe, from yours divided, this had given me means. By Hercules, the writing of Octavius. I know it well. Tis that prescribing hand, young as it was, that led the way to mine, and left me but the second place in murder. See, see, Ventidius, here he offers Egypt, and joins all Syria to it as a present, so in requital she forsake my fortunes and join her arms with his. And yet you leave me, you leave me, Antony, and yet I love you. Indeed I do. I have refused a kingdom, that is a trifle, for I could part with life, with anything, but only you. Oh, let me but die with you. Is that a hard request? Next living with you, tis all that heaven can give. Alexis aside. He melts. We conquer. No, you shall go. Your interest calls you hence. Yes, your dear interest pulls too strong for these weak arms to hold you here. Takes his hand. Go, leave me, soldier, for you're no more a lover. Leave me dying. Push me, all pale and panting from your bosom. And when your march begins, let one run after, breathless almost for joy, and cry, She's dead! The soldiers shout, you then, perhaps, may sigh, and muster all your Roman gravity. Ventidius chides, and straight your brow clears up, as I had never been. Gods, it is too much, too much for man to bear. What is it for me, then, a weak, forsaken woman and a lover? Here let me breathe my last. Envy me not this minute in your arms. I'll die apace, as fast as e'er I can, and end your trouble. Die? Rather let me perish. Loosen nature, leap from its hinges, sink the props of heaven, and fall the skies to crush the netherworld. My eyes, my soul, my all. Embraces her. And what's this toy? In balance with your fortune, honour, fame. What is Ventidius? It outweighs them all. Why? We have more than conquered Caesar now. My queen's not only innocent, but loves me. This, this is she who drags me down to ruin. But could she escape without me? With what haste would she let slip her hold, and make to shore, and never look behind? Down on thy knees, blasphemer as thou art, and ask forgiveness of wronged innocence. I'll rather die than take it. Will you go? Go? Whither? Go from all that's excellent? Faith, honour, virtue, all good things forbid, that I should go from her, who sets my love above the price of kingdoms. Give ye gods, give to your boy, your Caesar, this rattle of a globe to play with all, this gugar world, and put him cheaply off, and not be pleased with less than Cleopatra. She's wholly yours, my heart so full of joy that I shall do some wild extravagance of love in public, and the foolish world, which knows not tenderness, will think me mad. Oh, women, 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 all the gods have not such power of doing good to man as you of doing harm. Exit. Our men are armed. Unbar the gate that looks to Caesar's camp. I would revenge the treachery he meant me, and long security makes conquest easy. I am eager to return before I go, for all the pleasures I have known beat thick on my remembrance. How I long for night, that both the sweets of mutual love may try, and triumph once o'er Caesar ere we die. Act Three At one door enter Cleopatra, Carmion, Iris, and Alexis, a train of Egyptians. At the other, 
Antony and Romans. The entrance on both sides is prepared by music. The trumpets first sounding on Antony's part, then answered by timbrels, etc., on Cleopatra's. Carmion and Iris hold a laurel wreath betwixt them, a dance of Egyptians. After the ceremony, Cleopatra crowns Antony. I thought how those white arms would fold me in, and strain me close, and melt me into love. So pleased with that sweet image, I sprung forwards, and added all my strength to every blow. Come to me, come my soldier to my arms. You've been away too long from my embraces. But when I have you fast and all my own, with broken murmurs and with amorous sighs, I'll say you were unkind, and punish you, and mark you red with many an eager kiss. My brighter Venus. Oh, my greater Mars. Thou joins to swell my love. Suppose me come from the Phlegrian plains, where gasping giants lay, cleft by my sword, and mountain tops paired off each other blow to bury those I slew. Receive me, goddess. Let seize the spread his subtle nets. Like a Vulcan in thy embraces, I would be beheld by heaven and earth at once, and make their envy what they meant their sport. Let those who took us blush. I would love on with awful state, regardless of their frowns, as their superior gods. There's no satiety of love in thee. Enjoyed thou still art new. Perpetual spring is in thy arms, the ripened fruit but falls, and blossoms rise to fill its empty place, and I grow rich by giving. Enter Ventidius and stands apart. Oh, now the danger's past, your general comes. He joins not in your joys, nor minds your triumphs, but with contracted brows looks frowning on, as envying your success. Now on my soul he loves me, truly loves me. He never flattered me in any vice, but awes me with his virtue. Even this minute, methinks, he has a right of chiding me. Lead to the temple. I'll avoid his presence. It checks too strong upon me. Exhaunt the rest. As Antony is going, Ventidius pulls him by the robe. Emperor! Antony, looking back. Tis the old argument. I pray thee spare me. But this one hearing, Emperor. Let go my robe, or by my father Hercules. By Hercules' father, that's yet greater, I bring you somewhat you would wish to know. Thou seest we are observed. Attend me here, and I return. Exit. I am waning in his favour. Yet I love him. I love this man who runs to meet his ruin. And sure the gods like me are fond of him. His virtues lie so mingled with his crimes as would confound their choice to punish one and not reward the other. Re-enter Antony. We can conquer, you see, without your aid. We have dislodged their troops. They look on us at distance, and like curves escaped from the lion's paws, they bay far off and lick their wounds, and faintly threaten war. Five thousand Romans, with their faces upward, lie breathless on the plain. Tis well, and he who lost them could have spared ten thousand more. Yet if by this advantage you could gain an easier peace while Caesar doubts the chance of arms. Oh, think not on Ventidius. The boy pursues my ruin. He'll know peace. His malice is considerable in advantage. Oh, he's the coolest murderer. So staunch he kills and keeps his temper. Have you no friend in all his army who has power to move him? Meganus or Agrippa might do much. They're both too deep in Caesar's interests. We'll work it out by dint of sword or perish. Fain I would find some other. Thank thy love. Some four or five such victories as this will save thy further pains. Expect no more. Caesar is on his guard. I know, sir, you have conquered against odds. But still you draw supplies from one poor town, and of Egyptians. He has all the world, and at his beck nations come pouring in to fill the gaps you make. Pray, think again. Why dost thou drive me from myself to search for foreign aids, to hunt my memory, and range all o'er a waste and barren place to find a friend? 
the wretched have no friends. Yet I had one, the bravest youth of Rome, whom Caesar loves beyond the love of women. He could resolve his mind as fired as wax, from that hard, rugged image melt him down, and mould him in what softer form he pleased. Him would I see, that man of all the world, just such a one we want. He loved me too, I was his soul, he lived not but in me. We were so closed within each other's breasts, the rivets were not found that joined us first. That does not reach us yet. We were so mixed as meeting streams, both to ourselves were lost. We were one mass, we could not give or take, but from the same. For he was I, I he. Ventidius aside. He moves as I would wish him. After this I need not tell his name. "'Twas Dolabella. "'He's now in Caesar's camp.' <laughs> "'No matter where, since he's no longer mine. "'He took unkindly that I forbade him Cleopatra's sight, "'because I feared he loved her. "'He confessed he had a warmth which, for my sake, he stifled, "'for it were impossible that two, so one, should not have loved the same. "'When he departed, he took no leave, "'and that confirmed my thoughts.' It argues that he loved you more than her, else he had stayed. But he perceived you jealous, and would not grieve his friend. I know he loves you. I should have seen him then, ere now. Perhaps he has thus long been laboring for your peace. Would he were here? Would you believe he loved you? I read your answer in your eyes. You would. Not to conceal it longer, he has sent a messenger from Caesar's camp with letters. Let him appear. I'll bring him instantly. Exit Ventidius, and re-enters immediately with Dolabella. Antony runs to embrace him. Tis himself, himself my holy friendship. Art thou returned at last, my better half? Come, give me all myself. Let me not live if the young bridegroom, longing for his knight, was ever half so fond. I must be silent, for my soul is busy about a nobler work. She's new come home like a long absent man, and wanders o'er each room, a stranger to her own, to look if all be safe. Thou hast what's left of me, for I am now so sunk from what I was, thou finds me at my lowest watermark. The rivers that ran in and raised my fortunes are all dried up, or take another course. What I have left is from my native spring. I have still a heart that swells in scorn of fate, and lifts me to my banks. Still you are the lord of all the world to me. Why, then I yet am so, for thou art all. If I had any joy when thou wert absent, I grudged to myself. Methought I'd rob thee of thy part. But, O oh, my Dolabella, thou hast beheld me other than I am. Hast thou not seen my morning chambers filled with sceptred slaves who waited to salute me, with eastern monarchs who forgot the sun to worship my uprising? Menial kings ran coursing up and down my palace yard, stood silent in my presence, watched my eyes, and, at my least command, all started out like races to the goal. Slaves to your fortune. Fortune is Caesar's now, and what am I? What you have made yourself, I will not flatter. Is this friendly done? Yes, when his end is so, I must join with him. Indeed I must, and yet you must not chide. Why am I else your friend? Take heed, young man, how thou upbraidst my love. The queen has eyes, and thou too hast a soul. Canst thou remember, when, swelled with hatred, thou beheldst her first as accessory to thy brother's death? Spare my remembrance. T'was a guilty day, and still the blush hangs here. To clear herself, for sending him no aid, she came from Egypt. Her galley down the silver Sidness road, the tackling silk, the streamers waved with gold, the gentle winds were lodged in purple sails. Her nymphs, like nereids, round her couch were placed, where she, another seaborne Venus, lay. No more. I would not hear it. Oh, you must. She lay, and lent her cheek upon her hand, and cast a look so languishingly sweet, as if, secure of all beholders' hearts, neglecting she could take them. 
Boys, like cupids, stood fanning with their painted wings the winds that played about her face. But if she smiled, a darting glory seemed to blaze abroad, then men's desiring eyes were never wearied, but hung upon the object. To soft flutes the silver oars kept time, and while they played, the hearing gave new pleasure to the sight, and both the thought. T'was heaven, or somewhat more, for she so charmed all hearts, that gazing crowds stood panting on the shore, and wanted breath to give their welcome voice. Then, Dolabella, where was then thy soul? Was not thy fury quite disarmed with wonder? Didst thou not shrink behind me from those eyes and whisper in my ear, Oh, tell her not that I accused her with my brother's death? And should my weakness be a plea for yours? Mine was an age when love might be excused, when kindly warmth and when my springing youth made it a debt to nature. Yours? Speak boldly. Yours, he would say, in your declining age, when no more heat was left but what you forced, when all the sap was needful for the trunk, when it went down, then you constrained the course and robbed from nature to supply desire. In you... I would not use so harsh a word. Tis but plain dotage. Ha! T'was urged to home, but yet the loss was private that I made. T'was but myself I lost. I lost no legions. I had no world to lose, no people's love. This from a friend? Yes, Antony, a true one, a friend so tender that each word I speak stabs my own heart before it reach your ear. Oh, judge me not less kind, because I chide. To Caesar I excuse you. O oh, ye gods, have I then lived to be excused to Caesar? As to your equal. Well, he's but my equal. While I wear this, he never shall be more. I bring conditions from him. Are they noble? Methinks thou shouldst not bring them else. Yet he is full of deep dissembling, knows no honour divided from his interest. Fate mistook him, for nature meant him for usurer. He's fit indeed to buy, not conquer kingdoms. Then granting this, what power was theirs, who wrought so hard a temper to honourable terms? I was my Dolabella, or some god. Nor I, nor yet Messinus, nor Agrippa. They were your enemies, and I, a friend, too weak alone, yet t'was a Roman's deed. T'was like a Roman done. Show me that man who has preserved my life, my love, my honour. Let me but see his face. That task is mine, and heaven thou knowst how pleasing. Exit Ventidius. You'll remember to whom you stand obliged? When I forget it, be thou unkind, and that's my greatest curse. My queen shall thank him too. I fear she will not. But she shall do it. The queen, my Dolabella, hast thou not still some grudgings of thy fever? I would not see her lost. When I forsake her, leave me my better stars, for she has truth beyond her beauty. Caesar tempted her at no less price than kingdoms to betray me. But she resisted all. And yet thou chidest me for loving her too well. Could I do so? Yes, there's my reason. Re-enter Ventidius with Octavia, leading Antony's two little daughters. Antony, starting back. Where? Octavia there? What, is she poison to you? A disease? Look on her, view her well and those she brings. Are they all strangers to your eyes? Has nature no secret call, no whisper they are yours? For shame, my lord, if not for love, receive them with kinder eyes. If you confess a man, meet them, embrace them, bid them welcome to you. Your arms should open, even without your knowledge, to clasp them in. Your feet should turn to wings to bear you to them, and your eyes dart out, and aim a kiss ere you could reach the lips. I stood amazed to think how they came hither. I sent for them. I brought them in unknown to Cleopatra's guards. Yet are you cold? Thus long I have attended for my welcome, which, as a stranger, sure I might expect. 
Who am I? Caesar's sister. That's unkind. Had I been nothing more than Caesar's sister, no, I had still remained in Caesar's camp. But your Octavia, your much injured wife, though banished from your bed, driven from your house, in spite of Caesar's sister, still is yours. Tis true, I have a heart disdains your coldness, and prompts me not to seek what you should offer. But a wife's virtue still surmounts that pride. I come to claim you as my own, to show my duty first, to ask, nay beg, your kindness. Your hand, my lord, tis mine, and I will have it. Taking his hand. Do. Take it. Thou deserv'st it. On my soul, and so she does. She's neither too submissive, nor yet too haughty, but so just a mean shows, as it ought, a wife and Roman too. I fear, Octavia, you have begged my life. Begged it, my lord? Yes, begged it, my ambassadress. Poorly and basely begged it of your brother. Poorly and basely I could never beg, nor could my brother grant. Shall I, who to my kneeling slave could say, Rise up and be a king, shall I fall down and cry, Forgive me, Caesar? Shall I set a man, my equal in the place of Jove, as he could give me being? No, that word forgive would choke me up and die upon my tongue. You shall not need it. I will not need it. Come. You've all betrayed me. My friend, too, to receive some vile conditions. My wife has bought me with her prayers and tears, and now I must become her branded slave. In every peevish mood she will upbraid the life she gave. If I but look awry, she cries, I'll tell my brother. My hard fortune subjects me still to your unkind mistakes, but the conditions I have brought are such you need not blush to take. I love your honour, because tis mine. It never shall be said Octavia's husband was her brother's slave. Sir, you are free, free even from her you loathe, for though my brother bargains for your love, makes me the price and cement of your peace, I have a soul like yours. I cannot take your love as arms, nor beg what I deserve. I'll tell my brother we are reconciled. He shall draw back his troops, and you shall march to rule the east. I may be dropped at Athens, no matter where. I never will complain, but only keep the barren name of wife, and rid you of the trouble. Was ever such a strife of sullen honour? Both scorn to be obliged. Oh, she has touched him in the tenderest part. See how he reddens with despite and shame to be outdone in generosity. See how he winks, how he dries up a tear that fain would fall. Octavia, I have heard you, and must praise the greatness of your soul, but cannot yield to what you have proposed, for I can never be conquered but by love, and you do all for duty. You would free me, and would be dropped at Athens. Was not so? It was, my lord. Then I must be obliged to one who loves me not, who to herself may call me thankless and ungrateful man. I'll not endure it, no. Ventidius aside. I am glad it pinches there. Would you triumph over poor Octavia's virtue? That pride was all I had to bear me up, that you might think you owed me for your life, and owed it to my duty, not my love. I have been injured and my haughty soul could brook but ill the man who slights my bed. Therefore you love me not. Therefore, my lord, I should not love you. Therefore you would leave me. And therefore I should leave you, if I could. Her soul's too great after such injuries to say she loves, and yet she lets you see it. Her modesty and silence plead her cause. Oh, Della Bella. Which way shall I turn? I find a secret yielding in my soul. But Cleopatra, who would die with me, must she be left? Pity pleads for Octavia, but does it not plead more for Cleopatra? 
Justice and pity both plead for Octavia. For Cleopatra, neither. One would be ruined with you, but she first had ruined you. The other you have ruined, and yet she would preserve you. In everything their merits are unequal. Oh, my distracted so! Sweet heaven, compose it. Come, come, my lord, if I can pardon you, methinks you should accept it. Look on these, are they not yours? Or stand they thus neglected as they are mine? Go to him, children, go. Kneel to him, take him by the hand, speak to him. For you may speak, and he may own you too without a blush. And so he cannot all his children. Go, I say, and pull him to me, and pull him to yourselves from that bad woman. You, Agrippina, hang upon his arms, and you, Antonia, clasp about his waist. If he will shake you off, if he will dash you against the pavement, you must bear it, children, for you are mine, and I was born to suffer. Here the children go to him, etc. Was ever sight so moving? Emperor. Friend. Husband. Father. I am vanquished. Take me, Octavia. Take me, children. Share me all. Embracing them. I've been a thriftless debtor to your loves, and run out much in riot from your stock. But all shall be amended. O oh, blessed hour. O oh, happy change. My joy stops at my tongue. But it has found two channels here for one, and bubbles out above. Antony to Octavia. This is thy triumph. Lead me where thou wilt, even to thy brother's camp. All there are yours. Enter Alexis hastily. The queen, my mistress, sir, and yours. Tis past. Octavia, you shall stay this night. Tomorrow, Caesar and we are one. Exit leading Octavia. Dolabella and the children follow. There's news for you. Run, my officious eunuch. Be sure to be the first. Haste forward. Haste, my dear eunuch, haste. Exit. This downright fighting fool, this thick-skulled hero, this blunt, unthinking instrument of death, with plain dull virtue has outgone my wit. Pleasure forsook my earliest infancy, the luxury of others robbed my cradle, and ravished thence the promise of a man. Cast out from nature, disinherited, of what her meanest children claim by kind, yet greatness kept me from contempt, that's gone. Had Cleopatra followed my advice, then he had been betrayed, who now forsakes. She dies for love, but she has no need joys. Gods, is this just that I, who know no joys, must die because she loves? Enter Cleopatra, Carmion, Iris, and Train. Oh, madam, I have seen what blasts my eyes. Octavia's here. Peace with that raven's note. I know it too. And now I'm in the pangs of death. You are no more a queen. Egypt is lost. What tellest thou me of Egypt? My life, my soul is lost. Octavia has him. O oh, fatal name to Cleopatra's love. My kisses, my embraces now are hers, while I... But thou hast seen my rival. Speak. Does she deserve this blessing? Is she fair, bright as a goddess? And is all perfection confined to her? It is. Poor I was made of that coarse matter which, when she was finished, the gods threw by for rubbish. She's indeed a very miracle. Death to my hopes. A miracle. Alexis, bowing. A miracle. I mean of goodness, for in beauty, madam, you make all wonder cease. I was too rash. Take this in part of recompense, but oh! Giving a ring. I fear thou flatterest me. She comes! She's here! 
Fly, madam. Caesar's sister. Were she the sister of the thunderer Jove, and bore her brother's lightning in her eyes, thus would I face my rival. Meets Octavia with Ventidius. Octavia bears up to her. Their trains come up on either side. I need not ask if you are Cleopatra. Your haughty carriage shows I am a queen. Nor need I ask you who you are. A Roman, a name that makes and can unmake a queen. Your lord, the man who serves me, is a Roman. He was a Roman till he lost that name to be a slave in Egypt. But I come to free him thence. Peace, peace, my lover's Juno. When he grew weary of that household clog, he chose my easier bonds. I wonder not your bonds are easy. You have long been practised in that lascivious art. He is not the first for whom you spread your snares. Let Caesar witness. I loved not Caesar. Twas but gratitude I paid his love. The worst your malice can is but to say the greatest of mankind has been my slave. The next. But far above him in my esteem is he whom law calls yours, but whom his love made mine. Octavia coming up close to her. I would view nearer that face which has so long usurped my right, to find the inevitable charms that catch mankind so sure, that ruined my dear lord. Oh, you do well to search. For had you known but half these charms, you had not lost his heart. Far be their knowledge from a Roman lady, far from a modest wife. Shame of our sex! Dost thou not blush to own those black endearments that make sin pleasing? You may blush who want them. If bounteous nature, if indulgent heaven, have given me charms to please the bravest man, should I not thank them? Should I be ashamed and not proud? I am that he has loved me, and when I love not him, heaven change this face for one like that. Thou lovest him not so well. I love him better and deserve him more. You do not, cannot. You have been his ruin. Who made him cheap at Rome, but Cleopatra? Who made him scorned abroad, but Cleopatra? At Actium, who betrayed him, Cleopatra? Who made his children orphans and poor me a wretched widow? Only Cleopatra. Yet she who loves him best is Cleopatra. If you have suffered, I have suffered more. You bear the specious title of a wife to gild your cause and draw the pitying world to favour it. The world condemns poor me. For I have lost my honour, lost my fame, and stained the glory of my royal house, and all to bear the branded name of mistress. There wants but life, and that too I would lose for him I love. Be it so, then. Take thy wish. Exit with her train. And tis my wish. Now he is lost, for whom alone I lived. My sight grows dim. And every object dances and swims before me in the maze of death. My spirits, while they were opposed, kept up; they could not sink beneath a rival's scorn. But now she's gone, they faint. Mine have had leisure to recollect their strength and furnish counsel to ruin her. Who else must ruin you? Vain promiser, lead me, my Carmian. Nay, your hand too, Iris. My grief has weight enough to sink you both. Conduct me to some solitary chamber, and draw the curtains round. Then leave me to myself, to take alone my fill of grief. There, I till death, will his unkindness weep as harmless infants moan themselves asleep. Act Four. Enter Antony and Dolabella. Why would you shift it from yourself on me? Can you not tell her you must part? I cannot. I could pull out an eye and bid it go, and tell her should not weep. Oh, Dolabella, 
How many deaths are in this word depart? I did not trust my tongue to tell her so. One look of hers would thaw me into tears, and I should melt till I were lost again. Then let Ventidius, he's rough by nature. Oh, he'll speak too harshly. He'll kill her with the news. Thou, only thou. Nature has cast me in so soft a mould, that but to hear a story feigned for pleasure of some sad lover's death moistens my eyes and robs me of my manhood. I should speak so faintly, with such fear to grieve her heart, she'd not believe it earnest. Therefore, therefore thou only, thou art fit. Think thyself me, and when thou speak'st, but let it first be long, take off the edge from every sharper sound. And let our parting be as gently made as other loves begin. Wilt thou do this? What you have said so sinks into my soul that, if I must speak, I shall speak just so. I leave you then to your sad task. Farewell. I sent a word to meet you. Goes to the door and comes back. I forgot. Let her be told. I'll make her peace with mine. Her crown and dignity shall be preserved if I have power with Caesar. Oh, be sure to think on that. Fear not, I will remember. Antony goes again to the door and comes back. And tell her too how much I was constrained. I did not this, but with extremest force. Desire her not to hate my memory, for I still cherish hers. Insist on that. Trust me, I'll not forget it. Then that's all. Goes out and returns again. Will thou forgive my fondness this once more? Tell her, though we shall never meet again, if I should hear she took another love, the news would break my heart. Now I must go, for every time I have returned I feel my soul more tender, and my next command would be to better stay and ruin both. Exit. Men are but children of a larger growth. Our appetites are apt to change as theirs, and full as craving too, and full as vain. And yet the soul, shut up in her dark room, viewing so clear abroad, at home sees nothing. But like a mole in earth, busy and blind, works all her folly up and casts it outward to the world's open view. Thus I discovered, and blamed the love of ruined Antony, yet wished that I were he to be so ruined. Enter Ventidius above. Alone, and talking to himself. Concerned, too. Perhaps my guess is right. He loved her once, and may pursue it still. Oh, friendship, friendship, ill canst thou answer this, and reason worse. Unfaithful in the attempt, hopeless to win, and if I win, undone, mere madness all. And yet the occasion's fair. What injury to him to wear the robe which he throws by? None, none at all. This happens as I wish. To ruin her yet more with Antony. Enter Cleopatra talking with Alexis. Carmian Iris on the other side. She comes. What charms have sorrow on that face? Sorrow seems pleased to dwell with so much sweetness. Yet now and then a melancholy smile breaks loose, like lightning in a winter's night, and shows a moment's day. If she should love him too. A eunuch there. That porpoisey bodes ill weather. Draw, draw near, sweet devil, that I may hear. Dolabella goes over to Carmion and Iris, seems to talk with them. Believe me, try to make him jealous. Jealousy is like a polished glass, held to the lips when life's in doubt. If there be breath, twill cuts the damp and show it. I grant you jealousy is a proof of love, but tis a weak and unavailing medicine. It puts out the disease and makes it show, but has no power to cure. Tis your last remedy, and strongest too, and then this Dolabella who's so fit to practice on. He's handsome, valiant, young, and looks as he were laid for nature's bait to cut weak woman's eyes. He stands already more than half suspected of loving you. The least kind word or glance you give this youth will kindle him with love. Then, like a burning vessel set adrift, you'll send him down a main before the wind to fire the heart of jealous Antony. 
can I do this? Ah, oh, no, my love's so true that I can neither hide it where it is, nor show it where it is not. Nature meant me a wife, a silly, harmless household dove, fond without art and kind without deceit. But fortune that has made a mistress of me has thrust me out to the wide world, unfurnished of falsehood to be happy. Force yourself, the event will be, your lover will return, doubly desires to possess the good which one he feared to lose. I must attempt it, but oh, with what regret. Exit Alexis. Cleopatra comes up to Dolabella. So, now the scene draws near. They're in my reach. Cleopatra to Dolabella. Discoursing with my women, might not I share in your entertainment? You have been the subject of it, madam. How and how? Such praises of your beauty. Mere poetry. Your Roman wits, your Gullus and Tibullus, have taught you this from Cytheris and Delia. Those Roman wits have never been in Egypt. Cytheris and Delia else had been unsung. I, who have seen, had I been born a poet, should choose a nobler name. You flatter me, but tis your nation's vice. All of your country are flatterers, and all false. Your friends like you. I'm sure he sent you not to speak these words. No, madam, yet he sent me. Well, he sent you? Of a less pleasing errand. How less pleasing? Less to yourself or me? Madam, to both. For you must mourn, and I must grieve to cause it. Cleopatra aside. You, Carmian, and your fellow, stand at a distance, hold up my spirits. Aloud. Well, now your mournful matter, for I am prepared, perhaps can guess it too. I wish you would, for tis a thankless office to tell ill news, and I, of all your sex, most fear displeasing you. Of all your sex, I soonest could forgive you, if you should. Most delicate advances. Women, women! Dear damned inconstant sex. In the first place, I am to be forsaken. Is not so? I wish I could not answer to that question. Then pass it o'er, because it troubles you. I should have been more grieved another time. Next, I am to lose my kingdom. Farewell, Egypt. Yet, is there any more? Madam, I fear your too deep sense of grief has turned your reason. No, no, I am not run mad. I can bear fortune, and love may be expelled by other love, as poisons are by poisons. You o'erjoy me, madam, to find your griefs so moderately borne. You've heard the worst. All are not false like him. No, heaven forbid they should. Some men are constant. And constancy deserves reward, that's certain. Deserves it not, but give it leave to hope. I'll swear thou hast my leave. I have enough, but how to manage this? Well, I'll consider. Exit. I came prepared to tell you heavy news, news which I thought would fright the blood from your pale cheeks to hear. But you have met it with a cheerfulness that makes my task more easy, and my tongue, which on another's message was employed, would gladly speak its own. Hold, Dolabella. First, tell me, were you chosen by my lord? Or sought you this employment? He picked me out as his bosom friend. He charged me with these words. The message then I know was tender, and each accent smooth, to mollify that rugged word, depart. Oh, you mistake. He chose the harshest words, with fiery eyes and contracted brows. He coined his face in the severest stamp, and fury shook his fabric like an earthquake. He heaved for vent and burst like bellowing Etna, in sounds scarce human. Hence away forever, let her be gone, the blot of my renown and bane of all my hopes. Let her be driven, as far as men can think, from man's commerce. She'll poison to the center. At the time of this speech, Cleopatra seems more and more concerned, till she sinks quite down. Oh, I can bear no more. Help, help. O oh, wretch, O oh, cursed, cursed wretch, what have I done? Help! Chafe a temple's eros. Bend. Bend her forward quickly. 
Heaven be praised. She comes again. Oh, let him not approach me. Why have you brought me back to this loathed being, the abode of falsehood, violated vows, and injured love? For pity, let me go. For if there be a place of long repose, I'm sure I want it. My disdainful lord can never break that quiet, nor awake the sleeping soul, with hollowing in my tomb such words as fright her hence. Unkind, unkind. Dolabella, kneeling. Believe me, tis against myself I speak. That sure desires belief, I injured him. My friend ne'er spoke those words. Oh, had you seen how often he came back, and every time with something more obliging and more kind to add to what he said, what dear farewells, how almost vanquished by his love he parted, and leaned to what unwillingly he left. I, traitor that I was, for love of you, but what can you not do who made me false? I forged that lie, for whose forgiveness kneels this self-accused, self-punished criminal? With how much ease believe we what we wish? Rise, Dolabella, if you have been guilty, I have contributed and too much love has made me guilty too. The advance of kindness which I made was feigned to call back fleeting love by jealousy, but t'would not last. Oh, rather let me lose than so ignobly trifle with his heart. I find your breast fenced round from human reach, transparent as a rock of solid crystal, seen through but never pierced. My friend, my friend, what endless treasure hast thou thrown away? and scattered like an infant in the ocean, vain sums of wealth which none can gather thence. Could you not beg an owl's admittance to his private ear? Like one who wanders through long barren wilds, and yet foreknows no hospitable inn is near to succour hunger, eats his fill before his painful march. So would I feed a while my famished eyes before we part, for I have far to go, if death be far, and never must return. Ventidius with Octavia behind. From hence you may discover... Oh, sweet, sweet! Would you indeed? The pretty hand in earnest. I will for this reward. Takes her hand. Draw it not back. Tis all I e'er will beg. They turn upon us. What quick eyes has guilt? Seem not to have observed them, and go on. They enter. Saw you the emperor, Ventidius? No. I sought him, but I heard that he was private. None with him but Hipparchus, his freedman. Know you his business? Giving him instructions and letters to his brother Caesar. Well, he must be found. Exalt Dolabella and Cleopatra. Most glorious impudence. She looked, methought, as she would say. Take your old man, Octavia. Thank you, I'm better here. Well, but what use make we of this discovery? Let it die. I pity Dolabella, but she's dangerous. Her eyes have power beyond Thessalian charms to draw the moon from heaven. For eloquence the sea-green sirens taught her voice their flattery. And while she speaks, night steals upon the day, unmarked of those that hear. Then she's so charming, age buds at sight of her, and swells to youth. The holy priests gaze on her when she smiles, and with heaved hands, forgetting gravity, they bless her wanton eyes. Even I, who hate her with a malignant joy, behold such beauty, and while I curse, desire it. Antony must needs have some remains of passion still, which may ferment into a worse relapse, if now not fully cured. I know this minute with Caesar he's endeavouring her peace. You have prevailed. She walks away. But for a further purpose, I'll prove how he will relish this discovery. What? Make a strumpet's peace? It swells my heart. It must not, shall not be. His guards appear. Let me begin, and you shall second me. Enter Antony. Octavia, I was looking you, my love. What? Are your letters ready? I have given my last instructions. Mine, my lord, are written. Then Didius, drawing him aside. My lord. A word in private. When saw you, Dolabella? Now, my lord, he parted hence. 
and Cleopatra with him. Speak softly. Twas by my command he went to bear my last farewell. Ventidius aloud. It looked indeed like your farewell. More softly. My farewell. What secret meaning have you in those words of my farewell? He did it by my order. Ventidius aloud. Then he obeyed your order. I suppose you bid him do it with all gentleness, all kindness, and all love. How she mourned, the poor forsaken creature. She took it as she ought. She bore your parting as she did Caesar's, as she would another's. Were a new love to come? Antony aloud. Thou dost belie her, most basely and maliciously belie her. I thought not to displease you. I have done. Octavia coming up. You seem disturbed, my lord. A very trifle. Retire, my love. It was indeed a trifle. He sent... Antony angrily. No more. Look how thou disobeyest me. Thy life shall answer it. Then tis no trifle. Ventidius to Octavia. Tis less, a very nothing. You too saw it, as well as I, and therefore tis no secret. She saw it? Yes. She saw young Dolabella. Young Dolabella? Young. I think him young, and handsome too, and so do others think him. But what of that? He went by your command, indeed tis probable, with some kind message, for she received it graciously. She smiled, and then he grew familiar with her hand, squeezed it, and worried it with ravenous kisses. She blushed, and sighed, and smiled, and blushed again. At last she took occasion to talk softly, and brought her cheek up close, and leaned on his, at which he whispered kisses back on hers. And then she cried aloud, that constancy should be rewarded. This I saw and heard. What woman was it whom you heard and saw so playful with my friend? Not Cleopatra. Even she, my lord. My Cleopatra. Your Cleopatra. Dolabella's Cleopatra. Every man's Cleopatra. Thou liest. I do not lie, my lord. Is this so strange? Should mistresses be left and not provide against a time of change? You know she's not much used to lonely nights. I think no more on't. I know tis false, and see the plot betwixt you. You needed not have gone this way, Octavia. What harm is it you that Cleopatra's just? She's mine no more. I see and I forgive. Urge it no further, love. Are you concerned that she's found false? I should be, were it so. For though tis past, I would not that the world should tax my former choice, that I loved one of so light note. But I forgive you both. What has my age deserved that you should think I would abuse your ears with perjury? If heaven be true, she's false. Though heaven and earth should witness it, I'll not believe her tainted. I'll bring you then a witness from hell to prove her so. Seeing Alexis just entering and starting back. Nay, go not back. For stay you must and shall. What means, my lord? To make you do what most you hate. Speak truth. You are of Cleopatra's private council, of her bed council, her lascivious hours. Are conscious of each nightly change she makes, and watch her as Chaldeans do the moon, can tell what signs she passes through, what day. My noble lord. My most illustrious panda. No fine set speech, no cadence, no turned periods, but a plain homespun truth is what I ask. I did myself or hear your queen make love to Dolabella. Speak, for I will know by your confession what more passed betwixt them. How near the business draws to your employment, and when the happy hour. Speak truth, Alexis. Whether it offend or please Ventidius, care not. Justify thy injured queen from malice. Dare his worst. Octavia aside. See how he gives him courage, how he fears to find her false and shuts his eyes to truth, willing to be misled. 
As far as love may plead for woman's frailty, urged by desert and greatness of the lover, so far, divine Octavia, may my queen stand even excused to you for loving him, who is your lord. So far from brave Venditus, may her past actions hope a fair report. Tis well, and truly spoken. Mark Ventidius. To you, most noble emperor, her strong passion stands not excused, but wholly justified. Her beauty charms alone, without her crown, from int and marrow drew the distant vows of sighing kings. At her feet were played the sceptres of the earth, exposed on hips, to choose where she would reign. She thought a Roman only could deserve her, and of all Romans only Antony, and to be less than wife to you disdained their lawful passion. Tis but truth. And yet thou love, and your unmatched desert, have drawn her from her due regard of honour, at last heaven opened her unwilling eyes, to see the wrong she offered for Octavia, whose holy bed she lawlessly usurped. The sad effects of this imposterous war confirmed those pious thoughts. Ventidius aside. Oh, will you there? Observe him now, the man begins to mend and talk substantial reason. Fear not, eunuch, the emperor has given thee leave to speak. Else had I never dared to offend his ears with what the last necessity has urged on my forsaken mistress. Yet I must not presume to say her heart is wholly altered. No, dare not for thy life. I charge thee dare not pronounce that fatal word. Octavia aside. Oh, must I bear this? Good heaven, afford me patience. On, sweet eunuch, my dear half-man, proceed. Yet Dolabella has loved her long. He, next my godlike lord, deserves her best, and should she meet his passion, rejected as he is, by him she loved. Hence from my sight, for I can bear no more. Let furies drag thee quick to hell, let all the longer damned have rest. Each torturing hand do thou employ, till Cleopatra comes. Then join thou too, and help to torture her. Exit Alexis, thrust out by Antony. Tis not well. Indeed, my lord, tis much unkind to me to show this passion, this extreme concernment, for an abandoned, faithless prostitute. Octavia, leave me. I am much disordered. Leave me, I say. My lord. I bid you leave me. Obey him, madam. Best withdraw a while and see how this will work. Wherein have I offended you, my lord, that I am bid to leave you? Am I false or infamous? Am I a Cleopatra? Were I she, base as she is, you would not bid me leave you, but hang upon my neck take slight excuses, and fawn upon my falsehood. Tis too much. Too much, Octavia. I am pressed with sorrow too heavy to be borne, and you add more. I would retire and recollect what's left of man within to aid me. You would mourn in private for your love who has betrayed you. You did but half return to me. Your kindness lingered behind with her. I hear, my lord, you make conditions for her, and would include her treaty. Wondrous proofs of love to me. Are you my friend, Ventidius? Or are you turned Odolabella too, and let this fury loose? Oh, be advised, sweet madam, and retire. Yes, I will go, but never to return. You shall no more be haunted with this fury. My lord, my lord, love will not always last, when urged with long unkindness and disdain. Take her again, whom you prefer to me. She stays but to be called. Poor cousined man, let a feigned parting give her back your heart, which a feigned love first got. For injured me, though my just sense of wrongs forbid my stay, my duty shall be yours. To the dear pledges of our former love, my tenderness and care shall be transferred, and they shall cheer by turns my widowed nights. 
So take my last farewell, for I despair to have you whole, and scorn to take you half. Exit. I combat heaven, which blasts my best designs. My last attempt must be to win her back. But oh, I fear in vain. Exit. Why was I framed with this plain, honest heart, which knows not to disguise its griefs and weakness, but bears its workings outward to the world? I should have kept the mighty anguish in, and forced a smile at Cleopatra's falsehood. Octavia had believed it, and it stayed. But I am made a shallow, forded stream, seen to the bottom, all my clearness scorned, and all my faults exposed. Enter Dolabella. See where he comes, who has profaned the sacred name of friend, and worn it into vileness. With how secure a brow and specious form he gilds the secret villain. Sure that face was meant for honesty, but heaven mismatched it, and furnished treason out with nature's pomp to make its work more easy. Oh, my friend. Well, Dolabella, you performed my message. I did, unwillingly. Unwillingly? Was it so hard for you to bear our parting? You should have wished it. Why? Because you love me. And she received my message with as true, with as unfeigned a sorrow as you brought it. She loves you, even to madness. Oh, I know it. You, Dolabella, do not better know how much she loves me. And should I forsake this beauty, this all-perfect creature? I could not, were she mine. And yet you first persuaded me. How come you altered since? I said at first I was not fit to go. I could not bear her sighs and see her tears. But pity must prevail, and so, perhaps, it may again with you. For I have promised that she should take her last farewell. And see, she comes to claim my word. Enter Cleopatra. False, Dolabella. What's false, my lord? Why, Dolabella's false. And Cleopatra's false, both false and faithless. Draw near, you well-joined wickedness, you serpents, whom I have in my kindly bosom warmed till I am stung to death. My lord, have I deserved to be thus used? Can heaven prepare a newer torment? Can it find a curse beyond our separation? Yes, if fate be just, much greater. Heaven should be ingenious in punishing such crimes. The rolling stone and gnawing vulture were slight pains, invented when Jove was young, and no examples known of mighty ills. But you have ripened sin to such a monstrous growth to oppose the gods to find an equal torture. Two, two such. Oh, there's no further name. Two such. To me. To me, who locked my soul within your breasts. Had no desires, no joys, no life but you, when half the globe was mine. I gave it you and dowry with my heart. I had no use, no fruit of all but you. A friend and mistress was what the world could give. O oh, Cleopatra, O oh, Dolabella, how could you betray this tender heart, which with an infant fondness lay lulled betwixt your bosoms, and there slept secure of injured faith? If she has wronged you, heaven, hell, and you revenge it. If she has wronged me, thou wouldst evade thy part of guilt, but swear thou lovest not her. Not so as I love you. Not so? Swear, swear, I say, thou dost not love her. No more than friendship will allow. No more. Friendship allows thee nothing. Thou art perjured. And yet thou didst not swear thou lovest her not. But not so much, no more. O trifling hypocrite, who dares not to own to her, thou dost not love, no own to me, thou dost. Ventidius heard it, Octavius saw it. They are enemies. Alexis is not so. He, he confessed it. He who next hell best knew it, he avowed it. To Dolabella. Why do I seek a proof beyond yourself? You, whom I sent to bear my last farewell, Returned to plead her stay. What shall I answer? If to have loved be guilt, then I have sinned. But if to have repented of that love can wash away my crime, I have repented. 
Yet, if I have offended past forgiveness, let not her suffer. She is innocent. Ah, oh, what will a woman not do who loves? What means will she refuse to keep that heart where all her joys are placed? Twas I encouraged, twas I blew up the fire that scorched his soul to make you jealous, and by that regain you. But all in vain, I could not counterfeit. In spite of all the dams my love broke o'er, and drowned my heart again, fate took the occasion, and thus one minute's feigning has destroyed my whole life's truth. Thin caught by barts of falsehood, seen and broke through at first. Forgive your mistress. Forgive your friend. You have convinced yourselves. You plead each other's cause. What witness have you that you but meant to raise my jealousy? Ourselves and heaven. Guilt witnesses for guilt. Hence love and friendship. You have no longer place in human breasts. These two have driven you out. Avoid my sight. I will not kill the man whom I have loved and cannot hurt the woman. But avoid me. I do not know how long I can be tame, for if I stay one minute more, to think how I am wronged, my justice and revenge will cry so loud within me that my pity will not be heard for either. Heaven has but our sorrow for our sins, and then delights to pardon erring men. Sweet mercy seems its darling attribute, which limits justice. And if there were degrees in infinite, an infinite would rather want perfection than punish to extent. I can forgive a foe but not a mistress and a friend. Treason is there in its most horrid shape, where trust is greatest, and the soul resigned is stabbed by its own cards. I'll hear no more. Hence from my sight forever. How forever? I cannot go one moment from your sight, and must I go forever? My joys, my only joys, are centred here. What place have I to go to? My own kingdom? That I have lost for you. Or to the Romans? They hate me for your sake. Or must I wander the wide world o'er, oh, a helpless banished woman, banished for love of you, banished from you? Ay, there's the banishment. Oh, hear me, hear me with strictest justice, for I beg no favour. And if I have offended you, then kill me, but do not banish me. I must not hear you. I have a fool within me takes your part. But honour stops my ears. For pity, hear me. Would you cast off a slave who followed you, who crouched beneath your spurn? He has no pity. See if he gives one tear to my departure, one look, one kind farewell. O oh, iron heart, let the gods look down and judge betwixt us if he did ever love. No more. Alexis. A perjured villain. Antony to Cleopatra. Your Alexis, yours. Oh, twas his plot, his ruinous design, to engage you in my love by jealousy. Hear him, confront him with me, let him speak. I have, I have. And if he clears me not... Your creature, one who hangs upon your smiles, what is your eye to say or to unsay whate'er you please? I am not to be moved. Then... Must we part? Farewell, my cruel lord. The appearance is against me, and I go, unjustified, for ever from your sight. How I have loved, you know. How yet I love, my only comfort is, I know myself. I love you more, even now you are unkind, than when you loved me most. So well, so truly, I'll never strive against it, but die pleased to think you once were mine. Good heaven, they weep at parting. Must I weep too, that calls them innocent? I must not weep, and yet I must, to think that I must not forgive. Live, but live, wretched, tis but just you should, who made me so. Live from each other's sight, let me not hear you meet. Sit all the earth and all the seas betwixt your sundered loves. View nothing common but the sun and skies. Now. All take several ways, and each your own sad fate with mine deplore, that you were false, and I could trust no more. Act V. Enter Cleopatra, Carmion, and Iris. Be just to heaven, such virtue punished thus, will make us think that chance rules all above, 
and shuffles with a random hand the lots which man is forced to draw. I could tear out these eyes that gained his heart and had not power to keep it. Oh, the curse of doting on, even when I find it dotage. Bear witness, gods, you heard him bid me go. You, whom he mocked with imprecating vows of promised faith. I'll die. I will not bear it. You may hold me. She pulls out her dagger and they hold her. But I can keep my breath. I can die inward and choke this love. Enter Alexis. Help! O oh, Alexis, help! The queen grows desperate. Her soul struggles in her with all the agonies of love and rage, and strives to force its passage. Let me go! Art thou there, traitor? Oh, oh, for a little breath to vent my rage! Give, give me way, and let me loose upon him! Yes, I deserve it, for my ill-timed truth. Was it for me to prop the ruins of a fallen majesty, to place myself beneath the mighty flaw, thus to be crushed and pounded into atoms by its overwhelming weight? Tis too presuming for subjects to preserve that willful power which courts its own destruction. I would reason more calmly with you. Did you not our rule and force my plain, direct and open love into these crooked paths of jealousy? Now what's the event? Octavia is removed, but Cleopatra's banished. Thou, thou villain, hast pushed my boat to open sea, to prove at my sad cost, if thou canst steer it back. It cannot be. I'm lost too far. I'm ruined. Hence, thou impostor. Traitor, monster, devil, I can no more. Thou and my griefs have sunk me down so low that I want voice to curse thee. Suppose some shipwrecked seaman near the shore, dropping and faint with climbing up the cliff. If from above some charitable hand pull him to safety, hazarding himself to draw the other's weight, would he look back and curse him from his pains? The case is yours, but one step more, and you have gained the height. Sunk, never more to rise. Octavia is gone and Dolabella banished. Believe me, madam, Antony is yours. His heart was never lost, but started off to jealousy, love's last retreat and covert where it lies hid in sage, watchful in silence, and listening for the sound that calls it back. Some other, any man, tis so advanced, may perfect this unfinished work, which I, unhappy only to myself, have left so easy to his hand. Look well thou do it, else... Else what your silence threatens, Antony is mounted up the pharaohs, whom whose turret he stands surveying our Egyptian galleys, engaged with Caesar's fleet. Now death or conquest, if the first happen, fate acquits my promise. If we overcome, the conqueror is yours. A distant shout within. Have comfort, madam. Did you mark that shout? Second shout nearer. Hark! They redouble it. Tis from the port. The loudness shows it's near. Good news, kind heavens! Osiris, make it so. Enter Serapion. Where? Where's the queen? How frightfully the holy coward stares, as if not yet recovered of the assault, when all his gods and what's more dear to him, his offerings, were at stake. Oh, horror, horror! Egypt has been. Our latest hour has come. The queen of nations from her ancient seat is sunk forever in the dark abyss. Time has unrolled her glories to the last, and now closed up the volume. Be more plain. Say whence thou comest, though fate is in thy face, which from the haggard eyes looks wildly out and threatens ere thou speakest. 
I came from Pharos, from viewing, spare me and imagine it, our land's last hope, your navy. Vanquished? No, they fought not. Then they fled. Nor that. I saw, with Antony, your well-appointed fleet row out, and thrice he waved his hand on high, and thrice with cheerful cries they shouted back. Twas then false fortune, like a fawning strumpet, about to leave the bankrupt prodigal, with a dissembled smile would kiss at parting, and flatter to the last. The well-timed oars now dipped from every bank, now smoothly run to meet the foe, and soon indeed they met, but not as foes. In few we saw their caps on either side thrown up. The Egyptian galleys received like friends, passed through and fell behind the Roman rear. And now they all come forward and ride within the port. Enough, Sir Hepian, I've heard my doom. This needed not, you gods. When I lost Antony, your work was done. Tis but superfluous malice. Where's my lord? How bears he this last blow? His fury cannot be expressed by words. Thrice he attempted headlong to have fallen full on his foes, and aimed at Caesar's galley. Withheld, he raves on you, cries, he's betrayed. Should he now find you? Shun him, seek your safety till you can clear your innocence. I'll stay. You must not. Haste you to your monument while I make speed to Caesar. Caesar? No, I have no business with him. I can work him to spare your life and let this madman perish. Base, fawning wretch, wouldst thou betray him too? Hence from my sight, I will not hear a traitor. Twas thy design brought all this ruin on us. Serapion, thou art honest. Counsel me, but haste, each moment's precious. Retire. You must not yet see Antony. He who began this mischief, tis just he tempt the danger. Let him clear you. And since he offered you his servile tongue to gain a poor precarious life from Caesar, let him expose that fawning eloquence and speak to Antony. Oh, heavens, I dare not. I meet my certain death. Slave, thou deservest it. Not that I fear my lord, will I avoid him. I know him noble. When he banished me and thought me false, he scorned to take my life. But I'll be justified, and then die with him. Oh, pity me, and let me follow you. To death, if thou stir hence. Speak, if thou canst, now for thy life, which basely thou would save, while mine I prize at this. Come, good Serapion. Exalt Cleopatra, Serapion, Carmion, and Iris. Oh, that I less could fear to lose this being, which, like a snowball in my coward hand, the more it is grasped, the faster melts away. Poor reason, what a wretched aid art thou! For still, in spite of thee, these two long lovers, soul and body dread their final separation. Let me think, what can I say to save myself from death, no matter what becomes of Cleopatra? Antony within. Which way? Where? Ventidius within. This leads to the monument. Ah, me! I hear him, yet I'm unprepared. My gift of lines gone, and this court devil which I so oft have raised forsakes me at my need. I dare not stay, yet cannot far go hence. Exit. Enter Antony and Ventidius. O oh, happy Caesar, thou hast men to lead. Think not tis thou hast conquered Antony. But Rome has conquered Egypt. I'm betrayed. Curse on this treacherous train. 
Their soil and heaven infect them all with baseness, and their young souls come tainted to the world with the first breath they draw. The original villain sure no God created. He was a bastard of the sun, by Nile aped into man, with all his mother's mud crusted about his soul. The nation is one universal traitor, and their queen the very spirit and extract of them all. Is there yet left a possibility of aid from valour? Is there one god unsworn to my destruction? The least unmortgaged hope? For if there be, methinks I cannot fall beneath the fate of such a boy as Caesar. The world's one half is yet in Antony, and from each limb of it that's hewed away, the soul comes back to me. There yet remain three legions in the town. The last assault lopped off the rest. If death be your design, as I must wish it now, these are sufficient to make a heap about us of dead foes, an honest pile for burial. They are enough. We'll not divide our stars, but side by side fight emulous, and with malicious eyes survey each other's acts. So every death thou givest I'll take on me, as a just debt, and pay thee back a soul. Now you shall see I love you. Not a word of chiding more. By my few hours of life I am so pleased with this brave Roman fate that I would not be Caesar to outlive you. When we put off this flesh and mount together, I shall be shown to all the ethereal crowd. Lo, this is he who died with Antony. Who knows, but we may pierce through all their troops and reach my veterans yet. Tis worth attempting to o'erleap this gulf of fate and leave our wandering destinies behind. Enter Alexis, trembling. See, see that villain! See Cleopatra stamped upon that face, with all her cunning, all her arts of falsehood. How she looks out through those dissembling eyes! How he sets his countenance for deceit, and promises a lie before he speaks! Let me dispatch him first! Drawing his sword. Oh, spare me! Spare me! Hold! He's not worth your killing. On thy life, which thou mayst keep, because I scorn to take it, no syllable to justify thy queen. Save thy base tongue its office. Sir, she's gone, where she shall never be molested more by love or, or you. Fled to her dolabella. Die, traitor, I revoke my promise. Die! Going to kill him. Oh, hold! Uh, she's not fled. She is. My eyes are open to her falsehood. My whole life has been a golden dream of love and friendship. But now I wake. I'm like a merchant, roused from soft repose, to see his vessel sinking and all his wealth cast over. Ungrateful woman, who followed me, but as the swallow summer, hatching her young ones in my kindly beam, Singing her flatteries to my morning wake. But now my winter comes, she spreads her wings and seeks the spring of Caesar. Think not so. Her fortunes have in all things mixed with yours. Had she betrayed her naval force to Rome, how easily might she have gone to Caesar, secure by such a bribe? She sent it first to be more welcome after. Tis too plain, else would she have appeared to clear herself. Too fatally she has. She could not bear to be accused by you, but sat herself within her monument, looked down and sighed, while from her unchanged face the silent tears dropped, as they have not lived but stole their parting. Some indistinguished words she only murmured, at last she raised her eyes, and with such look as dying Lucrece cast. My heart forebodes. All for the best. Go on. She snatched her poniard, and ere we would prevent the fatal blow, plunked it within her breast, then turned to me. Go bear, my lord, said she, my last farewell, and ask him if he yet suspect my faith. More she was saying, but death rasped betwixt. She half pronounced your name with her last breath, and buried half within her. Heaven be praised! 
Then art thou innocent, my poor dear love, and art thou dead? Oh, these two words, their sound should be divided. Hadst thou been false and died, or hadst thou lived and hadst been true. But innocence and death, they shows no well above. Then what am I, the murderer of this truth, this innocence? Thoughts cannot form themselves in words so horrid as can express my guilt. Is it come to this? The gods have been too gracious, and thus you thank them for it? Antony to Alexis. Why stayest thou here? Is it for thee to spy upon my soul and see its inward mourning? Get thee hence. Thou art not worthy to behold what now becomes a Roman emperor to perform. Alexis aside. He loves her still. His grief betrays it. Good. The joy to find she's yet alive completes the reconcilement. I've saved myself and her. But, oh, the Romans! Fate comes too fast upon my wit, hunts me too hard, and meets me at its double. He exits. Would you had died a little sooner, though? Before Octavia went, you might have treated. Not will look tame, and would not be received. Come, rouse yourself, and let's die warm together. I will not fight. There's no more work for war. The business of my angry hours is done. Caesar is at your gates. Why, let him enter. He's welcome now. What lethargy has crept into your soul? Tis but a scorn of life, and just desire to free myself from bondage. Do it bravely. I will, but not by fighting. Oh, Ventilius, what should I fight for now? My queen is dead. I was but great for her. My power, my empire, were but my merchandise to buy her love, and conquered kings my factors. Now she's dead. Let Caesar take the world. An empty circle since the jewel's gone, which made it worth my strife. My being's nauseous, for all the bribes of life are gone away. Would you be taken? Yes, I would be taken, but as a Roman ought, dead my Ventidius, for I'll convey myself from Caesar's reach, and lay down life myself. Tis time the world should have a lord, and know whom to obey. We too have kept its homage in suspense, and bent the globe on whose each side we trod, till it was dented inwards. Let him walk alone upon it. I am weary of my part. My torch is out, and the world stands before me, like a black desert at the approach of night. I lay me down, and stray no further on. I could be grieved, but that I'll not outlive you. Choose your death, for I have seen him in such various shapes, I care not which I take. I'm only troubled, the life I bear is worn to such a rag, tis scarce worth giving. I could wish, indeed, we threw it from us with a better grace, that like two lions taken in the toils we might at last thrust out our paws and wound the hunters that enclose us. I have thought on it. Ventidius, you must live. I must not, sir. Wilt thou not live to speak some good of me, to stand by my fair fame and guard the approaches from the ill tongues of men? Who shall guard mine for living after you? Say, I command it. If we die well, our deaths will speak themselves and need no living witness. Thou hast loved me, and fain I would reward thee. I must die. Kill me, and take the merit of my death to make thee friends with Caesar. Thank your kindness. You said I loved you, and in recompense you bid me turn a traitor. Did I think you would have used me thus, that I should die with a hard thought of you? Forgive me, Roman. Since I have heard of Cleopatra's death, my reason bears no rule upon my tongue, but lets my thoughts break all at random out. I have thought better. Do not deny me twice. By heaven I will not. Let it not be to outlive you. 
Cure me first, and then die thou, for tis but just thou serve thy friend before thyself. Give me your hand. We soon shall meet again. Now, farewell, Emperor. They embrace. Methinks that word's too cold to be my last, since death sweeps all distinctions. Farewell, friend. That's all. I will not make a business of a trifle. And yet I cannot look on you and kill you. Pray, turn your face. I do. Strike home, be sure. Home as my sword will reach. He kills himself. Oh, thou mistakest. That wound was not of thine. Give it me back. Thou robs me of my death. I do indeed, but think it is the first time I e'er deceived you. If that may plead my pardon, and you, gods, forgive me, if you will, for I die perjured, rather than kill my friend. Dies. Farewell, ever my leader, even in death. My queen and thou have got the start of me, and I am the lag of honour. Gone so soon, is death no more? He used him carelessly, with a familiar kindness. Ere he knocked, ran to the door and took him in his arms, as who should say, You're welcome at all hours, a friend need give no warning. Books had spoiled him, for all the learned are cowards by profession. Tis not worth my further thought, for death... For aught I know is but to think no more. He is to be satisfied. Falls on his sword. I've missed my heart. O oh, unperforming hand, Thou never couldst have erred in a worse time. My fortune jades me to the last, And death, like a great man, takes state, And makes me wait for my admittance. Trampling within. Some, perhaps from Caesar. If he should find me living and suspect that I played booty with my life, I amend my work ere they can reach me. Rises upon his knees. Enter Cleopatra, Carmion, and Iris. Where is my lord? Where is he? There he lies, and dead Ventidius by him. My tears were prophets. I am come too late. Oh, that accursed Alexis! Runs to him. Art thou living? Or am I dead before I knew, and thou the first kind ghost that meets me? Help me, Satan! Send quickly! Send for help! They place him in a chair. I am answered. We live both. Sit thee down, my Cleopatra. I'll make the most I can of life. To stay a moment more with thee. How is it with you? Tis as with a man removing in a hurry, All packed up, but one dear jewel that his haste forgot, And he for that returns upon the spur. So I come back for thee. Too long, ye heavens, you have been cruel to me. Now show your mended faith, and give me back his fleeting life. It will not be, my love. I keep my soul by force. Say but, thou art not false. Tis now too late to say I'm true. I'll prove it and die with you. Unknown to me, Alexis feigned my death, which, when I knew, I hasted to prevent this fatal consequence. My fleet betrayed both you and me. And Dolabella. Scarce esteemed before he loved, but hated now. Enough. My life's not long enough for more. Thou sayest thou wilt come after. I believe thee, for I can now believe whate'er thou sayest, that we may part more kindly. I will come. Doubt not my life. I'll come and quickly too. Caesar shall triumph o'er no part of thee. But grieve not. While thou stayest, 
my last disastrous times. Think we have had a clear and glorious day, and heaven did kindly to delay the storm, just till our close of evening. Ten years, love, not a moment lost, but all improved to the utmost joy. What ages have we lived? And now to die each other's, and so dying, while hand in hand we walk in groves below, whole troops of lovers' ghosts shall flock about us, and all that train be ours. Your words are like the notes of dying swans, too sweet to last. Were there so many hours for your unkindness, and not one for love? No, not a minute. This one kiss, more worth than all I leave to Caesar. He dies. Oh, tell me so again, and take ten thousand kisses for that word. My lord, my lord, speak, if you yet have been. Sign to me if you cannot speak, or cast one look. Do anything that shows you live. He's gone too far to hear you, and this you see, a lump of senseless clay, the leavings of a soul. Remember, madam, he charged you not to grieve. And I'll obey him. I have not loved a Roman not to know what should become his wife, his wife, my Carmian, for tis to that high title I aspire. And now I'll not die less. Let dull Octavia survive to mourn him dead. My nobler fate shall knit our spousals with a tie too strong for Roman laws to break. Will you then die? Why shouldst thou make that question? Caesar is merciful. Let him be so, to those that want his mercy. My poor lord made no such covenant with him, to spare me when he was dead. Yield me to Caesar's pride? What? To be led in triumph through the streets? A spectacle to base plebeian eyes, while some dejected friend of Antony's, close in a corner, shakes his head and mutters a secret curse on her who ruined him? I'll none of that. Whatever you resolve, I'll follow, even to death. I only feared for you, but more should fear to live without you. Why now, tis as it should be. Quick, my friends, dispatch. Ere this the town's in Caesar's hands, my lord looks down concerned and fears my stay, lest I should be surprised. Keep him not waiting for his love too long. You, Carmian, bring my crown and richest jewels, with them the wreath of victory I made, vain augury, for him who now lies dead. You, Iris, bring the cure of all our ills. The aspects, madam? Must I bid you twice? Exit Carmian and Iris. Tis sweet to die when they would force life on me, to rush into the dark abode of death and seize him first. If he be like my love, he is not frightful, sure. We're now alone, in secrecy and silence, and is this not like lovers? I may kiss these pale, cold lips. Octavia does not see me, and, oh, Tis better far to have him thus than see him in her arms. Oh, welcome, welcome. Enter Carmian and Iris. What must be done? Short ceremony, friends, but yet it must be decent. First, this laurel shall crown my hero's head. He fell not basely, nor left his shield behind him. Only thou couldst triumph o'er thyself and thou alone wert worthy so to triumph. To what end are these ensigns of your pomp and royalty? Dull that thou art, why, tis to meet my love, as when I saw him first on Sidness's bank, all sparkling like a goddess so adorned, I'll find him once again. My second spousals shall match my first in glory. Haste, haste both, and dress the bride of Antony. "'Tis done. "'Now, seat me by my lord. "'I claim this place, "'for I must conquer Caesar too, like him, "'and win my share of the world. 
Hail, you dear relics of my immortal love! Oh, let no impious hand remove you hence, but rest for ever here. Let Egypt give his death that peace which it denied his life. Reach me the casket. Underneath the fruit, the aspic lies. Cleopatra putting aside the leaves. Welcome, thou kind deceiver, thou best of thieves, who with an easy key dost open life, and, unperceived by us, even steal us from ourselves, discharging so death's dreadful office, better than himself, touching our limbs so gently into slumber that death stands by, deceived by his own image, and thinks himself but sleep. Serapion within. The Queen! Where is she? The town is yielded. Caesar's at the gates. He comes too late to invade the rights of death. Haste, bear my arm, and rouse the serpent's fury. Holds out her arm and draws it back. Coward flesh, wouldst thou conspire with Caesar to betray me? as thou wert none of mine, I'll force thee to it, and not be sent by him, but bring myself, my soul, to Antony. Turns aside, and then shows her arm bloody. Take hence, the work is done. Serapion within. Break open the door, and guard the traitor well. The next is ours. Now, Carmian to be worthy of our great queen and mistress. They apply the aspects. Already, death, I feel thee in my veins. I go with such a will to find my lord, that we shall quickly meet. A heavy numbness creeps through every limb, and now tis at my head. My eyelids fall, and my dear love is vanquished. In a mist. Where shall I find him? Where? Oh, turn me to him and lay me on his breast. Caesar, thy worst. Now, part us if thou canst. Ah. Oh. <sighs> dies. Iris sinks down at her feet and dies. Carmion stands behind her chair as dressing her head. Enter Serapion, two priests, Alexis bound, Egyptians. Behold, Serapion, what havoc death has made. Twas what I feared. Charmion, is this well done? Yes, tis well done, and like a queen, the last of a great race. I follow her. Sinks down, dies. Tis true, she has done well. Much better thus to die than live to make a holiday in Rome. See how the lovers sit in state together, as they were giving laws to half mankind. The impression of a smile left in her face shows she died pleased with him for whom she lived and went to charm him in another world. Caesar's just entering. Grief has now no leisure. Secure that villain as our pledge of safety to grace the imperial triumph. Sleep, blessed pair, secure from human chance, long ages out, while all the storms of fate Fly o'er your tomb, and fame to late posterity shall tell. No lovers lived so great, or died so well. Excellent. End of Act 5 Epilogue Poets, like disputants, when reasons fail, have one sure refuge left, and that's to rail. Fop coxcomb fool are thundered through the pit and this is all their equipage of wit 
We wonder how the devil this difference grows betwixt our fools in verse and yours in prose. For faith, the quarrel rightly understood, tis civil war with their own flesh and blood. The threadbare author hates the gaudy coat, and swears at the gilt coach, but swears afoot. For tis observed of every scribbling man, he grows a fop as fast as e'er he can. Prunes up and asks his oracle, the glass, if pink or purple best become his face. For our poor wretch, he neither rails nor prays, nor likes your wit, just as you like his plays. He has not yet so much of Mr. Bayes. He does his best, and if he cannot please, would quietly sue out his writ of ease. Yet if he might his own grand jury call, by the fair sex he begs to stand or fall. Let Caesar's power the men's ambition move, but grace you him who lost the world for love. Yet if some antiquated lady say the last age is not copied in his play, heaven help the man who for that face must drudge which only has the wrinkles of a judge. Let not the young and beauteous join with those, for should you raise such numerous hosts of foes, young wits and sparks he to his aid must call. Tis more than one man's work to please you all. End of All for Love or the World Well Lost, a tragedy by John Dryden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.